Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri State Cadillac. On today's show, the wild card race is heating up. We look at how the Mets match up with the Braves as the two teams fight for that final third spot. We also go down on the farm to look at Drew Gilbert's return, a wild week, and I mean an absolutely wild week for our scoreboard predictions. And of course, we answer your mailbag questions. So subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch every episode on SMY's YouTube channel where you can leave a mailbag question or wherever you get your shows. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today and subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. If you'd like to drop us a review, drop us a mailbag question with that review. Watch us on YouTube and also ask mailbag questions in the comments under the show there as well. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined as always by my co-host, Joe DeMeo. And Joe, the week that was a lot of, eh, not the best, but I'll tell you what, before we recorded this show on Monday night, the week that was finished with a loud bang on a 3-0 count for Francisco Alvarez to walk off the Orioles. I am so thankful that Monday night happened the way it did. I mean, if, if y'all were in group text here, uh, this this was shaping up to be a much different show if Francisco Alvarez didn't just jump all over that 3-0 fastball from Sir Anthony Dominguez. And, you know, Connor, like you said, I think when we look back, if if this season doesn't go the way we want it to as Mets fans, Mets, you know, miss the playoffs by a game or two, because we talked about that on last week's show. This is going to come down to the wire, I think. We're going to look back at blowing the 5-0 lead against Oakland. You're going to look back at blowing the late lead against Miami. You're going to look back on losing two out of three to the Angels as missed opportunities. But, you know, there's nothing you can do about it now except step up and, and start playing better today. And uh, the Mets pulled out a, a, you know, exciting game Monday night against Baltimore. And, and now they have to keep going against these good teams with, you know, obviously Baltimore and then San Diego and Arizona to follow. So sometimes I like to kind of pull the curtain on our Mets pod group chat to really kind of lead with the show. And I think there's a lot of interesting talking points right now with this team, right, Joe? And that it's the frustrating part is, especially when you are a team that you're expected to maybe be a wild card kind of contender going into the year. A lot of people saw the Mets ceiling as, Hey, they're going to make a wild card spot. And then obviously the floor or even just a little bit below a little bit above that is that you're on the outside looking in that means your season is really really fragile where you know bad injury kodai senga uh a couple bad things you know that don't go your way a couple teams get better and you are on the outside looking in and something i said to you joe that is frustrating when the mets lose a series to the angels or the a's is that it puts their backs up against the wall where then they have to upset someone in a series where they are the underdog going into the series against the Orioles who are one of the best teams in baseball the Mets are obviously an underdog they, they're not supposed to necessarily win that series but it's baseball anything can happen at any moment where it's weird to say Joe and I know I do want to hear your frustrations with some decisions in that game and obviously we're really happy with the outcome it felt like the closest thing to a must win this year after they blew the lead, it, you know, obviously at the end of Peterson's run in this game, because you just want to get the bad scent out of those series, to bad teams. You want to beat a good team. It was a day the Braves were not playing. It feels like the Padres and the Diamondbacks are starting to run away and they're not completely gone, but they're starting to run away with two of the three spots. The last spot is coming down to, and yes, the Giants and the Cardinals are going to hang around. But it's ironically coming down to a rivalry, which is the Mets and the Braves, that you didn't want to let that one go because you've let opportunities go by the last two weeks, and you want to show that this season's not going anywhere. You can only let so many of these opportunities go away. The reality is you're going to blow games. The best teams in baseball blow games. The worst teams in baseball blow a heck of a lot of games and, and everything in between. So you're going to have those times happen you just can't let these continuously get away from you. And um, the Mets obviously kind of nipped that a little bit in, in game one against Baltimore. And, you know, hopefully they could go these next couple games and split. If they split these next two with Baltimore, I don't care if they win today and lose tomorrow or lose today and win tomorrow. 
as long as they take two out of three from Baltimore, I think you're, you're very happy with that. Um, and when you look at two on Monday, you said Atlanta's off. Not only are they off, but Austin Riley is taking the rest of the season off as he has a fractured hand and he's out for the season. Huge loss for them. Uh, Ketel Marte, I, as you said, Diamondbacks are cruising, playing great baseball. He's back on, on the injured list. So there's things kind of happening and you have to take advantage of ev almost every opportunity that comes about because, you know, I'm a patient guy and you even commented that it probably blows your mind how kind of like patient and even keeled I am this late in the season. But the harsh reality is that we're going to enter September here in the next 10 days. And when you enter September and this race is going to come down to a game, two games, three games, every single game matters in this stretch. So uh, now's the time for them to buckle up. And when they have these leads, you can't be blowing five zero leads to poor teams. That's, that's an unacceptable thing. Walking 11 batters. What, what happened in that Oakland game cannot, you know, keep repeating itself. But it was good that, you know, we'll talk about kind of everything that transpired Monday night, but it's good that it at least had a satisfactory ending. Yeah, that, the bottom line is just find ways to win right now, yep. right? I think that's the key for this team, and and that's what they're going to have to do when they go out west soon, and they, they have four with the Padres, and then they get three with the Diamondbacks. I mean, massive, massive series, but even if – you're not necessarily needing to take one of those spots from those teams. There's also something to showing that you can play with those teams. And right. you bring up a great point, Joe, with the Braves and, and losing a guy like Riley. Those teams, once upon a time, were probably looking at when Kodai Senga went down and went, man, like the Mets are going to be really, really vulnerable in, in terms of their pitching right now. And the Mets have dealt with this throughout pit with pitching all year. I mean, losing Brooks Raley, they've lost a ton of different rel relievers. You know, dead now Nunez is on his way back. He's been a really, really big loss for this bullpen. So you have to capitalize on the advantageous situations that are presented to you. And right now the reality is the Mets are neck and neck with a depleted Braves team. And nobody besides maybe themselves and their fans feel sorry for the Braves from the Mets side of things, because how many years? We don't have Jacob DeGrom. Oh, Pete Alonso got hit in the hand. Oh, like huge injuries over and over again. This is this is sports. It's a war of attrition most of the time. And right now, not guess what? The Braves aren't going anywhere, right? Like Marcelo Zuna is having a massive season. I'm sure Olsen's going to turn it around at some point. Although time Michael is running Harris out. Is back. Michael Harris is back. That's a really key point. They're not going to make any excuses, and they're going to find a way to hang around as well. But the Mets have to do more than just hanging around at this point and kind of seize it. And, you know, with that, there are some positives. Starling Marte is back in the sign of Joe. And that's somebody that not only does it give you a really, really impactful right-handed bat, but it gives speed on the base paths. And the more depth that this Mets team has that, listen, they have guys that are grinders that play every day, but they also have some guys that you need to be a little delicate with how much you run them into the ground. Marte is one of those guys. We've seen them try to be careful with J.D. Martinez. We've seen them try to be careful because he's had multiple injuries this year with Francisco Alvarez, and we've even seen them monitor Jesse Winker, who's just a rental, but they want to be really, really careful. So the depth of the lineup right now is in a good place, especially if their young catcher gets going, which he put an exclamation point on Monday night. Francisco Alvarez has had really no power for what feels like at least the last month, and the biggest part of his offensive game is his power. So if you're getting power from the seventh or eighth spot of the lineup to close the season, this just feels like a totally different team to me, especially why while Francisco Lindor is legitimately having an MVP caliber year. What always impresses me about Starling Marte is this guy is always suffering some type of lower body injury and he comes back and then he just steals bases like there's nothing wrong. He labors a bit in right field, which which you'll see, obviously. The, the defense isn't quite what it was. But seeing him come back on, you know, over the weekend and on Monday's game, going ahead and, and stealing that base, I'm like, I didn't think Marte was going to be, you know, unleashed as a stolen base threat, kind of like fresh off the IL. But I think overall, when you talk about the J.D. Martinez, the Jesse Winker, the Starling Marte, and how you want to kind of preserve those guys a little bit. I think it's good that you have kind of that right field and DH, like, uh, you know, bit of a circle where 
on one day, JD gets a day off, Winker DHs, and, and Marte plays right. Or Marte gets a day off, Winker plays right, and, and JD's DHing. So it just it gives options to Carlos Mendoza. And like you said about Francisco Alvarez, the power hasn't been there. We talked about he obviously had the thumb, he had the shoulder. So that those two things combined can not necessarily sap your power, but can certainly restrict it a bit. And, you know, just that spot, the vibe after the pimping, the the pointing and everything that he was doing, that was what Francisco Alvarez is. That's what I expected when Francisco Alvarez got called up. He's going to be that vibe guy. He's going to be, he wants the big moment. He wa- And he finally, you know, came through in a huge one. And sometimes it takes a moment like that to just kind of like flip someone's season. We've seen it countless times over the years with the Mets and with other teams. So hopefully that home run is a catalyst to Francisco Alvarez turning back into the hitter that he was at the beginning, you know, pre injuries and where he was a consistent hitter and obviously showed some power. So uh, yeah, obviously a, a great thing to see. And like you said, it just, simply lengthens the lineup if you have a guy like Alvarez down in the bottom third and he's able to provide some home run threats. And I think the the thing you're looking for, Joe, is just confidence with such a young player. Mm-hmm. And Alvarez has been, I know this going all the way back to the first time you ever spoke to him when he was not a major leaguer, just how confident of a player he is. And no matter how natural that DNA is to you, when you are having the type of stretch he's having, you lose confidence. You might not show it, but you feel it. And I think number one, him swinging on the three Oh and hitting the ball to the moon is just why not? Like, what do you have to lose at that point? Let's be real. The Mets are not the best team with driving runner runners in scoring position in, and they are already, there was already an out in the inning and he's not a threat on the basis. So I'm not saying it's time to go for all or nothing, but just dying to work that walk in that moment. I don't know what the, you know, the outcome ends up being in that scenario where now maybe you can get his confidence back up. It was a great moment for the team. You could see the excitement for the team and you could see the excitement for their young catcher as well. And I think, you know, going back to what you brought up with Marte, having the depth of all these guys too also allows them to, they're going to be cautious with how much they play them, but they don't need to be cautious with how they play. And what I mean by that is we've seen times where guys are a little banged up and then they don't try to steal bases. And then look at Trey Turner right this year in Philly. I know he was hurt for a while, but he's got like 14 steals. Trey Turner is a 40 plus in the bag steals guy. And that's because the Phillies rightfully so they're a great team. They're being a little bit more delicate with him right now with the Mets. If Starling Marte is on first base, he better be trying to steal second base. And I think that's how they're going to be operating. And, you know, you bring up the point of him kind of always dealing with things, but still finding a way to be one of the most efficient base stealers in the league. His instincts and the ability to read a pitcher and get a jump is some of the best I've ever seen since I've been watching the game. And I think sometimes that gets glossed over because of how fast and how gifted of an athlete he is, but he is a instinctual smart base stealer. And the Mets having that back in their lineup where Lindor isn't as fast, but he has really good instincts. We've talked about Bader. Bader is a wild man on the bases. It's not always pretty. He gets caught stealing a lot, and I like that he's fast. But Tyrone Taylor has good sprint speed, and so does Nimmo, but they're not base stealers all the time. Right. So this is a this is a big boost with Marte if he can be that guy again because it gives the Mets a different kind of threat. Uh, before we move on to the week that will be, what did you think of Mendoza and really Mendoza's usage of Buto so far with it's weird with the Mets right now it feels like he's their lifeline when they just got to get through a game but he did ride out that Peterson outing almost to a fault where Peterson's looked really good for a while now but we know Peterson is a guy that the confidence or the ability to get rattled kind of comes out of nowhere where he's cruising and then one thing goes wrong and a second thing goes wrong and you blink and the game is tied do you think that's a moment that Mendoza might learn from going forward I think so. You know, I I understand both sides of it's right. Like damned thing. if you do, damned if yeah. you don't. Situation right. a little. Yeah, and look, it worked with Luis Severino when he gate when he stuck with him for that extra innings, and that is that's the whole conundrum of being a, a big league manager, right? It it does have that feel to it that this feels like the right time to do it, and if it works, 
you're a genius. If it doesn't work, you made a mistake. And the reality was, I thought that the prudent move up three to one, take the six innings of one run ball that you got from David Peterson, go give Jose Buto the seventh, the eighth, hand it to Diaz, and let's just call it a day and, and get out with, with a win in game one. Um, but I was talking to our producer, Jeff, before Connor joined the stream, and we were kind of talking about it a little bit. The Mets obviously went with Peterson in the seventh. They went Buto in the eighth and then Diaz in the ninth. I wonder, are they prepping for September to use Buto closer to a regular reliever rather than what has kind of been advertised for the last month, which is we want him to throw 40 pitches every couple of days. So that way, if something happens to a starter, we could spot start him and he could give us 70, 75 pitches and, and we can move forward from there. You wonder if now they're they're having that urgency that, that you talked about and they're saying, maybe Buto doesn't pitch every day. Like he may not be available tonight, but going one in in game one allows him to be available in game three, potentially with only one day of rest. So whereas if he went two, it's not available for the rest of the series. So maybe, maybe that's a factor here. But, you know, I, before the inning started, I didn't want to keep Peterson in. And like you said, sometimes these things just snowball so quickly for him. The balk drove in the run. Focus was gone and he grooved the fastball. Home run, tie game. So, uh, you know, Peterson's been great. I just probably would have pulled him after six. And thankfully, it didn't ultimately cost the Mets. Yeah, at the end of the day, they get the win done. You know, it's those moments that you can learn about your pitcher. You can learn about the moment. You bring a, a, a great point about Buto. I think the big the big picture here is, Joe, whether it's Reed Garrett, whether it is the soon-to-return dead now Nunez, uh, whether it is a little bit more consistency from Stanek and Maton and Brazman, these guys got to get outs. And I, I don't even know if I'm at the point where I'm like, you got to get outs. You got to throw strikes. There's a difference between giving your team a chance and not giving your team a chance. And the way the Mets bullpen, excluding Buto and Diaz looked so good against the Orioles. I don't want that to get lost. I, I Diaz has not had his very Diaz year, but he's, I think he's looking more like himself besides Buto and Diaz. These guys got to at least throw strikes to give the guys with gloves a chance to make a play. And if the ball goes over the fence, the ball goes over the fence, but the constant habit, of walking guys, wild pitches, you know, just bad, bad baseball. These they just have to throw strikes. And, and once again, it's you know it can be that simple sometimes. And that's a button that Mendoza can't press. Like there's no besides those two guys, it feels like he doesn't have the. Well, I know this guy. It might not always be pretty, but he's going to throw strikes. All these guys have just been erratic and all over the place. So, and they all have a track record that. It's there. That's what's frustrating. I think we've seen good moments from Brazovan. Reed Garrett was untouchable at the beginning of the season. It has looked nothing like that guy lately. We know Stanek and Maton have had success in the past, but it hasn't been consistent with the Mets, so we'll see if they can get that going. All right, let's go down on the farm. Talk a little Drew Gilbert here, Joe. He is back. He is healthy. I did see the unfortunate spot where he was hit by a pitch, but that's not the uh, the injury that kept him sideline for a couple months to start the season what have we seen in drew gilbert's return a guy that at one point we thought he could be a major leaguer this year but injuries got in the way yeah i think at this point the the injury has essentially cost him the season and right now when i watch him play he looks like a guy getting his feet wet again like the numbers if you just google drew gilbert baseball reference and you look at how he's hitting you're gonna be like oh that's not particularly good but this is a guy that missed a ton of time uh, but he's he's back. He's playing every day, uh, so he's 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 looking healthy, and that's ultimately what's most important. Because we talked about the outfield situation with Marte and Winker and Tyrone Taylor. Uh, there's not really a, a spot or need to think about Drew Gilbert in the big leagues, obviously in 2024. So let's just let him be healthy, get through the rest of the season. Whatever the numbers are, the numbers are. I think Drew Gilbert is going to hit going forward. I'm not I'm not concerned about that. Uh, he just, you know, missed a bunch of time, the hamstring, and he had a, a setback. And, you know, just a couple things happened this year that really, you know, messed up his year from an injury standpoint. Though, was really good to see the other day, Luis Angel Acuna single. Luis Angel Acuna steals second base. 
Drew Gilbert RBI single. Uh, hopefully a, a sign of things to come. And, uh, you know, quickly also down on the farm because you're going to have an ad read about this this fella. Uh, Jet Williams is slated to get back into minor league games this week. So he will be with, uh, I believe, Low A St. Lucie, I think Wednesday. I don't have that for sure. But Are you surprised, Joe? We, we thought he could just be shut down for the year. I thought he was going to be shut down for the year. And then I started hearing more recently that they're like, we want to get him in a handful of games before the season's out. And I would expect he ends up at the Arizona fall league. So he'll get, you know, a bunch of at bats there uh, during the fall. But the, what's encouraging is that he's got over his wrist surgery and he's healthy enough to get back into game action. And, you know, we talk about jet and Gilbert. That's my number one and number three prospect in the system who both have essentially had lost years. So good to see that Gilbert's back and healthy and jet Williams is on the verge of returning the game action. This week, the Brooklyn Cyclones host the Jersey Shore Blue Claws affiliate of the Phillies. Friday features a Friday drink steal tickets and two drinks for just 22 bucks, plus postgame fireworks and it's Swifty Appreciation Night. There you go, Joe. The first 1,300 fans get Cyclones friendship bracelets. Saturday is Star Wars Night, also with postgame fireworks. And the first 1,500 fans receive a Jet Williams bobblehead. Sunday is Friends Night. Post-game kids run the bases, and the first 1,000 fans receive a How You Doing t-shirt. For tickets and full details, visit brooklyncyclones.com. You're listening to the Mets Pod, presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Joe, this is the moment I think the people have been waiting for. I know I've personally been waiting for. You've been waiting for. I don't ever remember a scoreboard week like this, and... I don't know if that that might be a bad thing that I just typically, you know, it could be 50-50 on a great week. Let's review the week that was with the scoreboard. Yes or no, will Francisco Alvarez hit at least one home run? Joe, you went no. I went yes. I got in at the buzzer. This is the most buzzer beater scoreboard of all time. Literally the last at bat of the week. Yes, I get a point. Yes or no, will the Mets win the series against the Marlins? Joe, you said yes. I said yes. We both get a point. Over under push for one Harrison Bader steals. Joe, you pushed. I went under. Bader did not have a steal. I get a point. Over under push was at one for JD Martinez home runs. Joe, you went under. I pushed. I got another point. Over under push was at two. Pete Alonzo home runs. Joe, you pushed. I went under. Joe, you get the point. Over under push was at eight. Francisco Lindor hits. Joe, you went over. I went over. Lindor had nine hits. Great line setting. Jeff, Jeff might have a future working for a casino if he wants it. Uh, shout out to that line setting right there. We each get a point. If you've noticed a trend here, we have one of us have at least gotten a point on every category. Over under push was at four for Mets wins. Joe, you pushed. I pushed. The Mets won four games. We each get a point. Probably the biggest scoreboard week we've ever had combined. Joe, you had four points. I had six of the seven categories. Uh, Pete Alonzo. Man, it's I'm glad he hit that second home run, but if he didn't, it would have been a perfect week. And I needed it. Nice for you. I really yeah. needed it because Joe still leads the season series, even after that, 47 to 42. So for this week, six games, two more against the Orioles, four in San Diego against the Padres. It's going to be a sweaty one. I'll start us off here with a yes or no. Will Jesse Winker hit at least one home run? Yes, it's time. It, it's just too long. At some point, this is my same thought process with Alvarez last week. At some point, it's time. Winker's hit. I think there's this thought process, Joe, that Winker's been a total bust of an acquisition. He's per at bat. He's fine. We just need to see a home run. What do you think, Joe? I'm going to say no. He hasn't. So while he's hitting well, it's a lot of line drives and ground balls finding holes. He's not elevating the ball kind of like I'm used to. So I, I'll just say no, but man, I hope Jesse Winker hits five home runs. Yeah, Winker right now, he only has had 51 plate appearances with the Mets so far. He's got 14 hits in those 51 plate appearances. Two are walks. So he's hitting at 286 right now. 14 of those hits, I believe 12 are singles. Two are doubles. That's it. Yeah, so he's been, a sing he's been a single sitter since he's they got been him. a legitimate single sitter. So we'll see if that can that trend can change. All right, Joe, this one's for you. Yes or no? Will Starling Marte hit at least one home run? Ooh, um, I'll say no. And I think I'll get to 
part of that reason why in in a couple in a couple picks from now. But I'll say no. I'm gonna go no as well because I don't know if he'll play enough that I want to take the odds. That and this is my. It would have been my thought with Winker, but I just think he is so due, and I got to look at the the this pitching uh, setup for the week. But I mean, Nash traditionally there's just more righties than lefties, right? And it feels yeah. like Marte would play every day against a lefty. Winker would play every day against a righty. Either way, I, I will go no as well. Yes or no? Will the Mets win the series against the Orioles? So I, I I just need one win. So I'm gonna say yes here, Joe. It's not that easy because they'll probably be dogs in both games, but I will say yes. I'm saying yes. I I think the Mets are good enough to sneak out another win, and uh, they face Zach Eflin, I believe, in Game Three, and uh, Dean Kramer here in Game Two. Forgot who the Game Two starter was, so that's why I was out of order. But I will say the Mets can split the next two, and you just you run away with two out of three against Baltimore and and get ready for the West Coast. All right, Joe, over-under pushes at four for Starling Marte starts in these six games. Why I said no to Marte is because I'm going under on this. I think they are going to gradually work him in to the rotation. I don't think he's back and he's playing every single day because that more or less makes Jesse Winker a bench player. Uh, so I don't think that's particularly what they want to do. I think they're going to try to bounce as much as possible. I could see you know Marte doing 50 percent of these games th three out of six so i'll say under i'm i have to agree with you on this one i know i need to chase some points here but this is just logic for me here here's the crux of it you're right joe that they want to be you know a little careful with him and you can't make the argument that okay dh him against lefties because jd martinez has an ops over 900 against lefties he has to play against lefties so at the end of the day, it'll probably be a 50-50 a split for Marte as well. I'm with you. Over-under push is at one for Mark Vientos' home runs. I'll push here. I'll go one home run for Vientos, but man, it feels like at any moment he could hit three in a week, Joe. I'm going to go over, be a, be a little different here. I think we're we're a little too similar on this scoreboard, and I, I don't want to get accused of following your picks just to make sure I win. <laughs> I'm going to be a true competitor. And like you said, it's Mark Vientos. Like you saw over the weekend and, you know, that the game against Oakland, I should say, so that's last Thursday, the two just easy opposite field home runs, just his ability to do that. He could just tee off at any moment. So I'll, I'll say he, he gets into two of them. Over under pushes at three for Mets starters going at least six innings. I feel like they've been better with this lately joe i mean it's not just severino throwing a complete game peterson has been pitching deep into games blackburn can give Man you six mania we know what mania can do yeah. i'm gonna go over on this one and say that you know that four out of the six can get it done what do you think i'm gonna push i think we're dealing with some more difficult offenses than i mean for the That's last month fair. we've been We've been having a scoreboard of games against the Marlins and the Nationals and the A's and the Angels. They have, they didn't do good enough against those teams, but uh, it was easier to kind of project going longer in game. So I will push and say half of the time they get six innings. Okay, let's move on to our next one here. Uh, of course, Mets wins. Over under push is at three. What do you got here, Joe? Tough, tough Ooh. games in these six. Tough games. That feels like such feels like such a good number. I think the Mets split one of the games with, with Baltimore, one of these next two, and then you split a four game series with San Diego. Uh, there there's three. So I will, I'll push and say three and three. And I think given the quality of opponent, you're signing up for three and three over the next six. All right, there it is. A wild scoreboard. We'll see if this week can continue. Hey, what about that. Did you pick? Oh, I didn't start that one. Mets went. <laughs> That's oh, I should have let you not pick. And yeah, then I would have got DQ'd. Win. I would have got DQ'd. See the competitor I am, people. I, I respect that, especially when you got a five cushion lead. It's real nice. Uh, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna go over here. This Mets season makes no sense at all. They lose to the worst teams in baseball. They somehow turn into a juggernaut when their backs are against the wall. Their backs are against the wall. I, the Padres are a weird team to figure out right now, Joe. Like I can't fully put my finger on them as well. I know they've, they've had some big injuries this year as well. Mm -hmm. And they did make some big acquisitions at the deadline for their bullpen and they can win with pitching, but 
And Jackson Merrill hits a home run every day, it seems like. I just that, go on Twitter and Jackson Merrill hit another home run. That's just well, what I want to see like. where he's at right now. I know it's crazy. I mean, 21 years old, and it does feel like he legitimately hits a home run every day. And he, so. ju- and he just started playing center field this year. Like, he he was a shortstop. Now they're just like, oh, you're a center fielder now, and he's been fine out there. It's a Hail Mary for me, but I'm, I'm going to go with the over there. All right, let's All right. close this thing out with, of course, our mailbag questions. And thank you to Oliver, who left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. A reminder, we always try to get to the five-star review questions. We appreciate those very, very much. If we do get to the playoffs, does our bullpen stand a chance? 5 nothing lead against the A's and walking the Marlins nonstop. I don't see a world in any multiverse where the bullpen helps us. Sorry to be a Debbie Downer. You got to respect a five-star review that is is a pessimistic question and a very fair one. I mean, we kind of had a little bit of this conversation, Joe, that outside of Buto and Diaz, the frustrating issue with the Mets is that these guys, it's not like when Adrian Hauser would come in, right? And you'd sit there and be like, okay, cool. He just gave up three balls, hit 110 miles an hour. And that wasn't always the case, but that when he got hit, when he got shelled, that's what it felt like. With a lot of these guys, it feels like they just nibble around the zone. And then it's okay, 3-2 count, walk up, wild pitch, runner moves on. So what do you think? Is there a world where, listen, they don't need to be the best bullpen in baseball, but can they be mediocre? I mean, they all have the track record that they can. Playoffs are the weirdest animal. We've talked about this before, right? Like 2015, Daniel Murphy just took over the playoffs and it was his time. Um, and I, I appreciate the Marvel reference with, with the multiverse here. And I think the multiverse exists that they can be good enough. I don't think there's going to be a point where their bullpen is a strength for them, particularly in the playoffs. But you don't have to go to a crazy multiverse to remember Ryan Stanek and Phil Maton were like, key cogs in Astros World Series winning bullpens. And when you have a guy like Edwin Diaz at the end of games, that that just heightens, you know, what what the floor could be. Certainly, uh, now is a bad time to say anything nice about the bullpen, given how the last, you know, handful of days have gone for them. Um, I, I think the bullpen can be okay. And a couple things to consider. When you get to the playoffs, you're not using a standard five-man rotation you could take a David Peterson if you want and put him in the bullpen. Uh, Sean Manai, I think, has established himself more as a starter, but similar conversation. If you wanted to move him to the pen in the playoffs, you can. And so far, so good on the Christian Scott throwing front. I don't want to put the the cart ahead of the horse here, but if Christian Scott can get back, he could be a potential factor in the bullpen. So, you know, the guys that are down roster that you don't really – have any faith in those are guys those guys probably just aren't making your playoff roster anyway and it'll just be other people in their place so i think there is a chance in this multiverse that the bullpen can be good enough to keep them alive uh but at the same time it's based on what we've seen it's probably pretty hard to believe me and i understand if you're rolling your eyes well if you if you want to buy into what joe's saying i i can't believe my own eyes here phil maton's career numbers pitching in the postseason and that's got to get got to get there he's pitched in 20 postseason games ranging from 2020 to 2023 and they weren't all with houston a little bit cleveland but obviously mostly houston 0.83 era in almost 22 innings pitch he's basically been untouchable for 22 innings of the postseason ryan stanick 23 games 20 innings pitch in the postseason 2.7 ERA. I mean, they're both elite relievers in the postseason. And really, all you got, you just got to navigate like, what, two or three weeks of games. That's all you got to do. It's what, What's so hard about that? So if you're wondering if can they flip that switch, they can. We just, as Mets fans, need to actually see it. All right. Yep. Steve Miller asked, what's your level of confidence for the Mets rotation for the balance of the season? In order to make the playoffs, are they needing to step up a little, stand pat, or could they drop off a bit and still be okay Joe, I don't really look at the rotation being an issue. I had bigger concerns with this rotation coming into the year, and they've been largely fine. I mean, everyone has their games where it's like, man, that was that was a rough five innings. McGill's not in the rotation anymore, so it feels like there's less of those, man, a grind of four and two-thirds kind of innings. 
Blackburn's been fine as an acquisition. Peterson's been, been good. I've been, yeah, I've been really, be fair. really satisfied with Blackburn. Bes the Oakland outing was not good, but besides the, the team that knows really him good. best, he's been very, yeah. very good. So I don't think they need to step it up. I guess the argument you could say is, which is unfair to them, they do need to step it up because if the Mets need to go to their bullpen in the sixth inning in a stretch of games, it, you would think they're doomed right now. That That's the counter argument if they can't figure out that side of things. Well, they certainly can't stand to take a step back. No, to the point they don't have any the room the for that. Is. They don't have any yeah. room. So they have to at minimum stand pat. Ideally, we are looking at the over for the six innings from a starter more regularly. If we're able to, to get there, I think that would be stepping up to me is pitching deeper in the games and not, not forcing Carlos Mendoza to use four or five relievers in, in a given night. So if they could step up, that'd be great. But at bare minimum, if they stay pat, I think it's good enough to keep them in this hunt, which ultimately that's what the Mets need to do for the next month is stay in the hunt as much as we want them to, you know, go on a 10 game winning streak and blow past the Braves. That's not realistic. So what you want to do is stay afloat. And, you know, when we get through game 162, just have one more win than the Braves have. That's all they got to do. Here's a fun second parter from Steve Miller, who said, who is the second most irreplaceable Met right now? Assuming Lindor is number one. So we both agree it's Lindor, number one, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. that, that's not really much of a debate. Who's yeah. number two, Who's number two for you? I know my number two. For me, and we, we've been talking about the, the bullpen for a while, I think if – could you imagine this game if they didn't have Edwin Diaz? Or, or Jose Buto? <laughs> or Buto. But, I mean, I guess Buto right, would though. be your closer. But, like, I think if this bullpen didn't have Edwin Diaz, there, it would be – well, I, I don't even know if I'd want to sit through some of those games, get, you know, getting to the end and trying to navigate a seventh, eighth and ninth, you know, without Diaz. So I think I lean Diaz, but man, it's also one of those things that you, you kind of always lean towards like the starting lineup, you know, more often in situations like this. But the way the bullpen has been so up and down and certainly down over the last few days, I think Edwin Diaz is essentially irreplaceable. I think it's Manaya. I don't really think it's. No, I like that. I don't. If you took Mania off this team right now, I think the Mets would be doomed. Honestly, I just when you look at, I understand the start against Seattle. He went three innings, which was maybe the worst baseball the Mets have played the entire year. Yeah. That stretch, not that game, that stretch, that series. I mean, seven innings against Miami, three runs before the Seattle start. Seven innings against St. Louis, no runs. Seven innings against the Twins, no runs. Against the Yankees, he only went four and two thirds of two runs because his pitch count was high. But Manaya on the year right now, three, four, six ERA. He's made every start. I, I think he is one of the leaders of this team. I, I don't know how the staff, this staff, with Senga being hurt, right. I don't think they could survive without Manaya. I don't. So, yeah. I, now, if, I, I think we, we both picked pitchers. Why don't we each pick a position player? To kind of round out the question. Hmm. Well, I think that's way yeah. harder because that is a lot. A lot like harder. I can easily agree with you on Diaz and you could probably agree with me in some world on Mania. Yeah. But I, I think position player just feels so wide open. I think the answer, and this may even sound not crazy. Are you going to say Vientos? I, I think I'm saying Vientos because if Mark Vientos goes down, he has been the Mets you know, second most consistent hitter Easily. behind Lindor for well over a month. And as much as I love, and let me tell you, I love posting Brett Beatty AAA home runs on Twitter, injected yeah. into my veins. Not only is it fun content, I love seeing a guy like him hit the heck out of a baseball. I love all the Twitter reactions to it. So, but I also would not feel particularly great if Mark Vientos were to go down today and Brett Beatty is now essentially the near everyday third baseman, or you're subbing in Jose Iglesias for defense. Uh, so I, I'm going Vientos, and you know Nimmo's had his up and down year, and Alvarez is important because who would be your backup catcher to Terenz? Yes. We saw uh, what it was like. Yeah. It was really fun. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I'm going to go Vientos just because of how good of a hitter he's been. I couldn't agree with you more, honestly. And the point is that you made is consistency. In the month of May, Vientos OPS, 917. 
the month of June, Vientos OPS, 888. The month of July, his OPS, 884. Right now in August, 798. Basically, by the time you're listening to this, it could be over 800 again. Vientos is the guy in the lineup that it's he's the same guy every month. He's the same exact guy. Every month, he's going to hit about six home runs. He's going to drive in a little under 20 RBI, uh, runs batted in. And he'll have an OPS hovering right around or below 900. So, and this has been a down month for him. We still have half the month left where it could easily go right back up. So you're right. Like the hot stretches in Nimmo, it's Nimmo. Because when Nimmo is hot, it just feels like he brings an element to the team that is so hard to replicate. But the cold stretches in Nimmo, he's not even in the top five. That's what's crazy about it. It's not been a good year for Pete, no matter how you slice it. It's not been a disaster. It's not like Pete's unplayable. No. It's just, it's just been okay. It. It's just it's just been okay, especially for the bar that he has set. Um, it's I agree with you completely. It's it's easily Vientos, which is if you said that, if you said that Vientos is the is imagine after we, door. Imagine ago? we said this. Imagine we said this at our spring training show where we're outside the first game. That that guy that was angry about Pete would have been yelling at us about something else. <laughs> yeah, we would have been not uh, not a warm welcome. All right. One more here. Um, oh man! All right, let's jump into this one from Jeff Cohen. There's you got a, you got a lot of questions this week. I truly I, I use an Alvarez. I use the Alvarez picture, and people uh, it's came the secret sauce. They really, it's great. A lot of them, though, and I'm I'll be honest here with the audience. A lot of them are Soto related, and I get it. But right now, and I am like. Couldn't be more in on the Juan Soto sweepstakes. I think yeah. about it multiple times a week as a fully grown man. It's ridiculous. I have zero interest in talking about it on this week's show. The Mets are where we were dying for them to be and where every game matters so much in a wild card race. I hope more than anything Juan Soto is a Met. But right now, it just it's out of sight for me. I just want the Mets we'll to make talk the about it. We'll talk about it every At week Nosa. from November till whenever he signs. So It'll we got plenty of Juan Soto. Show. Yeah. From when the season ends to when he signs, wherever that is, it will be the first topic on every show. There will be a variant question in the mailbag that has to do with Juan Soto, whether it's where he bats in the lineup. Do they build him an office in City Field? Like I believe A-Rod wanted once upon a time at Shea. We'll do the whole thing, but we're going to close out the show with the Brett Beatty question because you're listening to the Mets pod. Jeff Cohen, does the team view Beatty as a 4A player? He excels in the minors but struggles in the majors. Also, how has he fared at second base? All right. So defensively at second base, he is he is actually getting better. Do I think that is something that can be a regular position for him at the next level? I don't. Um, but I think if it increases his versatility, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And when it comes to the 4A player thing, I just want everyone to know, Nobody in baseball uses that term. That's that is a fan driven thing. Like it's, they don't it's talk very, like that. Um, it's really putting someone down. Yeah. And and the reality here is, yes, he has struggled at the big league level and he's been great at the triple A level. The thing is, it's been up here at the triple A level and it's been down here at the big league level it is very reasonable to surmise there is a middle ground somewhere there at the big league level. And it's very hard to find players that are that good at AAA and, you know, that low at the big league level. And we have to remember this is a 24 year old kid. And right. I know Alvarez has come up at 21 and been fantastic. We were having similar conversations about Mark Vientos just a few months ago, and now he's established himself. So, no, the Mets are not thinking he's a 4A player. Um, in fact, it's not outside the possibility that he's competing for a third base job next year, depending on what happens with Alonzo at first. Then does that move Vientos over? But, you know, saving offseason shows for offseason shows, uh, they don't talk like that. That's just not, not the way it is. And I suspect Brett Beatty is going to be one of the September call-ups here in the next 10 days, uh, 11 days, whenever September starts. And he'll get some opportunities to pinch hit, fill in. Like he he's going to he's going to get a, a little bit of, you know, opportunity here in September and, you know, hopefully 
hopefully this is the time that he could carry AAA to the big leagues. Because we talked about this with Vientos. He would go to AAA, he'd dominate, he would come up here, he'd get limited opportunities, and he would struggle. Hopefully this is the time that Beatty grabbed something at AAA and now he could bring it to the big leagues. Uh, I, I would say let's not give up on him. Yeah, the thing with Beatty, it, I mean, he's been good at Syracuse. He's hit a lot of home runs. I, he's I been, think... it, it's been a tough last month, so he was right. really dominating, but he, he's had a tough month, but he's picked it up the last two weeks or so. Okay. I think he has five home runs in the last nine games, um, so he's kind of getting back to it. I mean, inevitably, he was going to go through a slump of some form there. He, I don't think he was going to hit 370 forever. Uh, that's <laughs> a little lofty, but... I, I think, you know, he's circling back and starting to look better. And um, I do think he will probably be the September call up. This is the Mets pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And remember to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Leave us a review with a question and we'll look for it for a future mailbag. And of course, you can watch the show on SMY's YouTube channel. Become a subscriber over there as well. A massive, massive stretch ahead here for the Mets. Uh, the two more in front against the Orioles. They can close out that series, and they're going back out west to two teams that they're looking up at in the standings for the wild card. So a huge week ahead. Of course, we'll recap all of it next week. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll catch you then.